All right. Welcome everyone to Roland's Pass Cultural Culture and History. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Gilpin County Extension Director. And I'd like to also thank a few other P extension directors who helped me plan this uh, fun event. So Olivia Clark from Grand County Extension, Darren Davidson from Boulder County Extension, and Chris Kraus from Clear Creek Extension. So thank you ladies for helping make this uh, virtual event possible. Um, I guess without further ado, let's just start talking about this. So Jason's going to start our presentation out. Jason LaBelle is, a, is the director of the Center for Mountain and Plains Archaeology, and he's the so associate professor at Colorado State University, the Department of Anthropology. So welcome. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Jennifer, for hosting this, and thanks, everyone, for turning out on a, on a nice, cold uh, Monday night. Nowhere else to go with all the snow, so um, I'm happy to do this tonight and tag team with my friend and colleague Travis uh, Wright, who will be talking about about the last 150 years or so of, of Euro-American history up on top of Rollins Pass. And I'm going to take you back all the way to 12,000 years ago and talk about the ancient Native American use of this pass. Uh, and it's really significant as one of the great gates of, of uh, Colorado um, mountain geography as well as throughout North America. If you look on that picture I have right in front of you above the that little thing that says CMPA, you can actually see one of these rock walls. It's going to meander all the way to the top of that knoll that you see there in the horizon background. This one meanders for well over a half mile uh, to get to the top of that next knoll. I'm going to do two things uh, in my short time that I have tonight. I'm going to talk about what game drives are, these alpine game drives at Rollins Pass. We have similar forms throughout the entire world. Uh, but these are alpine above the tree limit. Uh, and this is the most significant cluster of sites in all of North America is at Rollins, Rollins Pass. <clears throat> and then I'm also going to talk about Rollins Pass as a case study of the work that we've been doing up there uh, since 2009. So let's talk about the game drives of the Colorado Mountains. So archaeologists have done a lot of work in the Alpine country in Colorado. And here in yellow, you can see that I've outlined all elevations in our state above about uh, 3,000 meters, which is about 10,000 feet in elevation. And we've recorded over 2,000 uh, ancient Native American sites above that elevation. Pretty impressive. And we've known about them since the 1870s. Uh, some of the first sites that were known are on top of Mount Blanco when that was being surveyed um, by some of the early uh, mapping surveys in our state. So on top of Mount Blanc, which is over 4,300 meters or 14,000 feet. We have dense concentrations here in the Colorado Front Range where Rollins Pass is located. Also places like Grand Mesa, as well as the San Juan Mountains. And there's a lot of folks involved in this research over the last 50 years or so. If we start to kind of uh, cull that information down to, to specific kinds of sites, an interesting pattern appears. And these Alpine hunting sites that I'll be talking about in the coming minutes are really restricted uh, to the Northern Colorado Front Range. Uh, those mountain ranges adjacent to Middle Park where about three quarters of these game drives are, are right between about I-70 uh, and the Northern part of Rocky Mountain National Park. And we'll get into the reasons for that in just a second. But again, really significant. We, we don't see anything like this in California or Wyoming or Washington state uh, in the Alpine country to quite the same degree. Well, what are these game drives? What do they look like? Well, they consist of these long sinuous walls. These black arrows are showing you one. This is in the Indian Peaks Wilderness area in the city of, water, uh, city of Boulder's watershed, the Murray site game drive. They've been known since the 1860s because they're pretty easy to see once you walk across these walls. They're not geological features. Here's an example of one on Rollins Pass. We don't think they've fallen over. Uh, they're no more than about knee high. Um, but they certainly have degraded through time, uh, being exposed for the last several thousand years ago. But these were never meant to be five feet, six feet, 10 feet tall. Uh, in some cases, we think brush was incorporated into them, but above the Alpine, that would have been a lot of labor to move uh, brush up there. So for the most part, these are meant to be just uh, barrier walls. Now associated with these are a variety of breastworks, these circular uh, structures, as well as U-shaped structures that are often multiple courses uh, in, high, in height. A lot of people, when you're up in the high country, you, you come across these things, think that they're just mining pits, prospecting pits, but they're very patterned in their location. And here's one that I'm standing in at Rollins Pass. You can see Winter Park there in the background, looking towards uh, 
down into the valley. The clear day you can see over to Berthoud Pass as well. And associated with these game blinds or these hunting blinds, as well as the rock walls, we also find stone tools. And we can use stone tools to tell time. And here's three examples of different shaped size stone tools. The brown one in the middle being the oldest and then other kinds of forms of corner notched and side notched arrow points. And just like uh, Fords and Edsels change through time and Chevys change through time and they go away, uh, so do these things. And we can, archeologists spend a lot of time, probably too much time tracking the coming and going of these things. So we can date these sites based upon these stone tools as well as bits of charcoal and animal bone as I'll talk about in the coming minutes. And friends like these, these little tiny, really beautiful green pieces of lichen, Rhizocarpum geographicum, the so-called map lichens that grow at very slow but steady rates. And we can use these kinds of things together to help us tell the story of game drives. So let's talk about Ronald's Pass uh, in particular, where we've been working since 2009. <clears throat> Ronald's Pass is located, I'm sure many of you have been there before, at the intersection of Grand, uh, Gilpin, and, um, and Boulder counties, right here along the Continental Divide. It's one of the great gates allowing easy access from the plains to the east to Middle Park uh, to the west. And that access point for humans is, is pretty significant. And people have been using this pass for at least 10,000 years, probably 12,000 years since the first peoples came into this continent. Uh, animals have certainly been using this as well because it's a very easy passing of the Continental Divide, especially as compared to areas to a little further north where it really gets pretty rugged. Uh, right away. So Rollins Pass is in a really sweet spot between moving between different kinds of ecosystems in Colorado. We've been working there since 2009, typically in, in July and early August when the weather turns a little bit better and we're kind of avoiding some of our afternoon lightning storms and rainstorms. Here's the, the field school out there that I teach in the summertime. This is 2017 when we had a pretty big project up there uh, trying to avoid the lightning. This particular summer was pr pretty bad. Uh, but we're building upon the research of those who came before us. These are friends and colleagues of mine that have now passed, but the late Jim Benedict and Byron Olson, who did some pioneering research up there uh, at the pass in the late 60s and early 70s and really kind of set some of the, the patterns and precedent that we've gone about trying to further in, uh, our understanding of this particular place. It's really based upon their work in the past that we, we, we move forward. Now we've been, uh, Kind of slow the last couple of years. I know people want us to get up there, but we actually have to write up our results and fulfill our permit obligations. And so we, we put out a whole series of publications and, and thesis projects. And these are some of the things uh, that are available for folks to read. On the lower left there, you'll also see a volume that Travis and Kate Wright have put out on Rollins Pass. I helped them with that book a little bit, but that's primarily their work. And you'll see a lot of those images uh, in the coming minutes today with, with Travis's work. But we have a lot of data and information about this place to share with you. So this is what you'd see us doing in a typical kind of uh, uh, late July kind of spot up on the pass or elsewhere in the Indian Peaks, uh, walking around doing survey work, trying to map some of these features in place. And at some point in time, actually crawling on the ground surface. We do a lot of crawling because a lot of things we find are pretty small. Uh, and Rollins Pass is an interesting place because it has such an incredible historic record from the last 150 years ago a lot of people have picked up things in the past. And so we had to look pretty hard uh, to find what's left out there, but it's incredible. This Native American story I'm gonna tell you what is still there, suggesting just how intensive this place was used uh, for the last 12,000 years or so. So this is just a map to show you some of the site locations that we have up on the pass. The red dots or red polygons are, are archeological sites that we've recorded. Uh, beginning in the 60s through our work in the, in the last 10 years or so. And, and the sites are found on the ridges as well as down in the lake valleys at these glacial cirques, other kinds of places. And I'll be talking about the game drives to, today, but there's equally interesting stories down at the lakes and all the access points down uh, to the west and to the east, including going down into the town of Fraser or down into towards Rollinsville. This is a continuous landscape of archeological sites. We've recorded over 50 sites uh, up on the pass alone that are associated with just Native American occupation and they go back to over 10,000 years ago. Uh, pretty impressive. We also have sites with ceramics, uh, with glass trade beads that are coming in from trading posts in, in the late 19th century. 
So the entire span of human occupation uh, in the Native American uh, tradition is, is found up top of the pounds. Now, why is it significant? As I said, it's an easy crossing of the continental divide and animals and humans have known this for a long time. So when animals move in this part of the world, they love Rollins Pass because it's pretty gentle. And if we could just kind of show you some, some gentle ways that animals might approach the pass, either from the north along the Continental Divide or from the west, southwest, coming up Ranch Creek, as those animals come up to the pass, they, they end up coming up to this pretty gentle uh, crossing. And this is where the, the railroad uh, area of Corona happens to be at the very top of the pass itself. Animals, when they get to that kind of the center of the pass, they have a choice. They can either go off to the northeast along that large ridge, which the you know, railroad used to wrap around, or they could head south uh, towards Radio Beacon and, and further south towards James Peak. But ingeniously, Native Americans figured this out a long time ago. And anywhere those animals went, they put up a game drive. And these stars that I have here are different elements of game drives, 12 of them in all, again, the densest concentration of all North America, essentially blocking any sort of way that animals would cross this. There are game drives in place to try to capture those animals. And you would have think this is a really important folks who didn't have access to going to Costco or to Whole Foods for the groceries. They actually had it done themselves. Uh, so an ingenious way of, of taking advantage of seasonal migration of animals. What do they look like? Well, here's an example of two really large sites. These are the largest two sites of the 12. The Olson site, uh, which we call 5BL147 in, in our Jarian, and the other one, BL148, which we now call the high grade site, are located on that tongue that's, that's going to the north and east of the main pass. You can see the pass is over there to the right. Uh, the old wagon roads uh, are, are present there. One's been improved by the Forest Service, are, are visible there. Below this image to the right is the railroad itself. And if you look very closely on this photo, as well as on satellite images, like in Google Earth, you can actually see the rock walls. They're that impressive that you can see them from, from satellite photography as well as aerial photography. Just to show you a very simple drawing, this is a schematic of just a portion of those walls. And what they do is they form a U or V shaped structure. Again, we see these globally from Mongolia to Tibet to the Middle East of these really amazing large uh, U and V-shaped structures that in some cases extend out for a half mile to a mile in size. And in this particular case, they all lead uh, downwind and upslope. And if you've ever been on Rollins Pass or in the mountains, from the right to the left of the image, it doesn't look that, that steep of a grade from this photo. But if we were to go out there and walk this, we'd be huffing and puffing because it's a very steep slope. And those walls go straight up the slope uh, to the left of a place that we call the intercept area. And so by the time those animals are kind of walking along these walls, they have no idea what they're walking into because again, they're walking with the wind and they're not gonna have any scent of any hunters that'll be waiting for them at the end of these rock walls. Now we have a variety of different kinds of things uh, showing up on this particular site at Olson. We spent a lot of time up, time up there. There's an area where they're, they have ground stones so they're grinding plants uh, on this particular site, probably not related to the game drive, but after the fact that grinding slabs are coming from lion sandstone down along the, the base of the front range and the same sandstone you'd buy at Corey's and Boulder or Larimer counties or you'd buy at Home Depot. We're finding it on top of these passes that's so being quarried and carried up here, these inch to two inch thick slabs. Intercept areas there, kind of note it, you'll see there's a thin light line that's going kind of uh, perpendicular to that, uh, the circle itself. That's a modern game trail that goes straight through the same intercept area. So today animals use the same pathway and we sure enough have put game cameras out there uh, to watch things like elk uh, walk across this game drive system. And the way these systems work is there's oftentimes an animal gathering basin that's found again, somewhere half mile to mile away where animals might be just gently grazing on these slopes or in the location of these other game drives in the area. And humans figure this out, send some task parties to get behind those animals and slowly nudge those animals. This, this is not a stampede. This is just kind of a, a persuasive push of animals to move downwind and away from these, these animals or these humans. Uh, and in doing so, they encounter these walls that have been built uh, by human hunters. Now to show you this isn't a fluke, elsewhere on the past, we see similar patterns. 
If you climb straight out of the Rollins Pass parking lot and go to the north along the Kamova Trail and you go really up that steep trail, if you've done that before above King and Corona Lakes, as you crest out on top of that hill, you run into three massive game drives. And it's pretty amazing. They're all situated with their Vs pointing to the south and east, which is exactly the, the pattern of wind in this particular portion of the Front Range. There's three different sites. And so we're, we're thinking that these are really based upon animals getting through one system, getting into another system. If they get through that system, they run into the third system. And that third system, the one on the right is the biggest of the bunch. And that's right before you descend down to the pass itself. The black lines are there that you can see the U and V-shaped walls. The red are concentrations of hunting blinds, which are just amazing to see how many they are. And the yellow just represents some of the stone tools that we found in association with these game drives. Now, mind you, this is 150 years after people started really using this path for recreation, and we're still finding these tools on the surface. And so something to think about tonight is just the sensitivity of these resources and making sure that if you do find things up there that you know people like Travis and myself, the Forest Service, you want to hear about these things because they really help build this record and story that we're telling you today. Examples of those walls. We know they're used in certain times of the year, essentially from, from early July is when the snow starts to melt. October, it starts to get snowed in. So we have a pretty narrow window there of July and August of September uh, that these walls are probably being used, which makes sense for animal migration if you know the animals in this area. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller. This is the ones from the game drive I just showed you. You can actually see two parallel lines of, of walls right here in the, uh, in the middle ground of this particular photo. This is looking out towards the south, uh, southwest Mount Epworth there is that kind of peak in the mid ground there. But again, not tall walls. These are not meant that things that you couldn't yourself just step over. They're not five feet tall. In most cases, they're, they're shin to knee high at the very most. Now you might think that I'm just BSing you and, and that how would these things ever work in terms of a game drive system? Well, again, we're not stampeding animals here. We're using the animal ethology or their behavior themselves as, as kind of the conditioning factor for these animals uh, to work in association with these walls. We don't have many images from Rollins Pass itself because it's just littered with people up there most of the year. But if we go to other kinds of remote areas of the Indian Peaks, and in this case, the James Peak Wilderness area like Cone Mountain, which is between Birth of Pass and Rollins, uh, we can see animal behavior uh, in association with these walls. This is the Cone Mountain Drive System, one of the more spectacular ones that we have in, this, in the Colorado Front Range. And here we have mule deer walking along the side of these walls. They hit the walls, they walk along the edge of the wall, but they don't step over the wall. They just walk parallel with it uh, and sure enough, it leads them right into these intercept zones where oftentimes the hunters are waiting in these hunting blinds for uh, pits. On Cone Mountain, we also have great images of bighorn sheep, big, big male bighorn sheep interacting with some of these game drives. And this a really kind of important bighorn sheep crossing is right there along kind of Cone Mountain going down towards Empire and back over towards I-70. What's waiting for those, those uh, animals? Well, people at the end of these rock walls, this is on the Olson site with one of those hunting blinds there. Uh, this is one of the more spectacular ones. And you can see there in the foreground, again, uh, a modern game trail. And examples of other blinds, again, this is uh, north of Rollins Pass along the Continental Divide, taking some measurements with students on these particular blinds. Other blinds, you can see Winter Park there uh, in the background. And this is how they basically work. As I mentioned before, we're looking at U and V-shaped concentrations of rock walls that lead into these concentrations of hunting blinds. We know from ethnographic records and dealing with living peoples that were still using bow technology in the 19th century, that really about 20 to 25 meters or about 60 feet or so is an effective shot distance for a bow. Beyond that, you're just wasting your shots. Uh, in, in obviously, lesser range is fine, but you have to get the animals to come in that close. So when we start plotting out things like uh, the radius from the center point of these blinds, we get concentrations of blinds, uh, suggesting that people are positioning themselves for optimized shots and kind of pooling their labor for places where humans are going to be or animals are going to be congregating in these game drive systems, and then basically being rained down with arrows. Uh, and darts uh, from spear throwers as they come into these intercept areas. Again, to show you that it's not a fluke, we can go to the north again. 
Same kind of pattern here. This is looking at 20 meters, a little bit smaller distance. But you can see these red clusters where we have overlaps of lines suggesting if those were occupied and people were shooting from them, obviously you wouldn't want to hit your friend in the blind uh, near you, but you could easily concentrate those shots where those V and U-shaped walls come together. And sure enough, the majority of our broken projectile points that we find like these uh, spear points or dart points from about 3000 years ago, they're found just beyond or right at that 20 to 25 meter distance, suggesting to us that these are lost shots or these were animals that were dispatched and they didn't, when they butchered them, they didn't re recover their stone tools, et cetera. But they're in that kind of sweet spot, right? Where, where we expect to see shot loss. Now, figuring out what they're hunting up there is a little more difficult. We do find animal bone. Uh, it's hard to say whether the animal bone that we're finding is just natural deaths that happen to die along these game drive walls versus those that were, were shot and then, and then processed and harvest it and taken away. But here's examples of, of animal bone from the high grade site that we were able to recover. We have found bone within hunting blinds themselves, uh, suggesting that people are processing these animals up there. It's, I don't think animals are dying within hunting blinds. And we find caches of projectile points sometimes within these hunting blinds themselves. But just to show you some other things that we do up in the high country, we also have built a pretty good fauna record by looking at places like ice patches where because of uh, global climate change, these ice patches are basically thawing and melting back and we're getting fauna that's been trapped in these ice patches for thousands of years. Bighorn sheep, elk, uh, deer, but also bison. So bison are crossing this high country. Our earliest bison dates are about 3000 years ago. So bison are also a, a particular prey, but we think most of these are used to hunt bighorn sheep as well as elk as our, as our main two uh, potential prey. Now, if you wrap all these kinds of things up in terms of dating and all that, I, I, I'm just short on time, but we can do a, a lot of things to date these sites, figure out their context, figure out how they're used. And so, for example, one of the sites on, on Rollins Pass is the Olson site. And we have a variety of dates from that site uh, that suggest it was first built about 3,000 years ago and then remodeled and used again about 1,000 years ago and then used again within the last 400 years or so. So these game drives are not just a one-time use. They really are built once and then modified, tinkered with, played with, and used for generation upon generation of Native American hunters. Uh, and so they really are an amalgamation of, of many, many thousands of years, in some cases, of the use, reuse, and remodeling of these game drives. So I'm cognizant of time. I'm really good. I got here to 25 minutes. Um, and so I'll end with just this, you know, why are so many people up in the Alpine country and why here at Rollins Pass? Well, it's a great gate. It's an easy way to cross the Continental Divide. People are up there procuring their winter stores of food. Kind of think about a big barn raising and how much food you could use from one of these game drives that you'd schlep down to the front range after you finished it and winter in places like Boulder and Fort Collins and Loveland. Uh, but there's also social reasons for coming together and building walls too. These are really kind of a uh, way for people to get together and share information and participate in larger kind of ritual, re, uh, seasonal uh, kinds of uh, gatherings uh, for Native American populations. Couldn't do this work with a, a whole bunch of folks, including all my students, undergraduate and graduate students, a variety of people that have helped us with funding and, and permission. So always have to thank those folks. But I thank you for your time and I'll, I'll take some questions a little bit later on. But at this point, I wanna turn it over to uh, to, uh, to Travis uh, for part two of this talk. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jason. Fascinating as always. All righty. So next, I'm going to present the last 160 years of Rollins Pass's history in the next 25 minutes. You'll notice several uh, recurring themes throughout this presentation. The first is overlapping history. There are many layers of overlapping history on Rollins Pass. Reversals of fortune, not just of people involved with Rollins Pass, but also of places. And finally, an enduring tapestry. There's a reason Rollins Pass calls to all of us. There's almost 100 people on a Monday night on this call. So there's something enduring about the Rollins Pass story. 
And one other thing to keep in mind during this presentation, history is not the story of strangers. It is the story of us had we been born a little earlier. So the story really picks up with uh, President Abraham Lincoln, who in the 1860s begins signing things like the Homestead Act of 1862, the Pacific Railways Act, really beginning that westward expansion across the plains and into the Rocky Mountains. And of course, one of the great gates that you come to is Rollins Pass. So this is the chapter of Horse and Wagon. And to tie uh, what Dr. LaBelle was just speaking about, there was a letter to the editor in the daily Rocky Mountain News in 1873. It was astride ads for wagons. And this article talked about those game drive walls that, uh, that Jason just mentioned. And the author of this article was John Quincy Adams Rollins. Rollins, as a real person, experienced so many different reversals of fortune in his lifetime. Uh, newspaper articles uh, talk about that he made uh, large sums of money and then lost those again. And early in his lifetime, he accumulated a considerable fortune freighting lumber on the Mississippi River. Rollins wasn't the best with money, though, when he didn't have it. Uh, people would prank him. They would come up to him in the streets saying, hey, Rollins, you owe me money. Even though they've never met Rollins, he didn't owe them money. It was just a, it was just a, a prank to, to take advantage of him and, and just uh, try to embarrass him, but kind of an interesting story. But ultimately, it was Rollins who built his toll wagon road into Middle Park by way of Boulder Pass. It was Rollins's developer who got the name changed from Boulder Pass to Rollins Pass in Rollins's honor. Every summer, Rollins would continue to improve that road. He would build a cribbing of logs, uh, which helped reduce the grade between the hills. He would make other improvements. And as you can see from this quote from Martin Parsons, Martin led 12,000 cattle across the pass in 1880. What was the cost of that? Well, at five cents a head, if you do some quick math, that's $600, which when you adjust for inflation was well over 10 grand back in those days. But if you just had one wagon drawn by one animal, it would just cost you $1.50 to go over Rollins's road. I get a question a lot about what were the wagons carrying? The appropriate way to ask that question is who were carrying the wagons. And that's just because the road was impossibly difficult. This is a photograph from Dr. LaBelle's collection. You can see the zigzag route going up the Continental Divide on the left. Uh, and newspaper articles, despite Rollins's hard work in improving that road, said that the trail is splendid for horses, but fearful for wagons, and that the only wonder is that a wagon can be taken over at all. But perhaps the harshest critique comes from Margaret Crawford, who uh, said that uh, it was a two-hour blizzard and the bumping was so hard, I thought I was nearly dead. So that's not a good endorsement of that road. Uh, Rollins, uh, there's one incredible story about a wonderful billiard match. It took 32 hours to complete. Uh, a lot of businesses in lower downtown Denver closed in order to watch this billiards match unfold. Uh, Rollins ultimately forfeited the match, losing $1,000. He needed sleep, uh, but he won $11,000, which in 1873 was a considerable amount of money. Rollins rests at Riverside, and his obituary in 1894 speaks of, of Rollins quite highly, that no man in northern Colorado was better known nor counted more warm friends than John Rollins. So I mentioned earlier a lot of overlapping history, and this is the chapter of mining history on Rollins Pass. So all of those wagon journeys that are heading up the right side of your screen, up Rollins's wagon road, some of those people stayed behind in order to mine for precious minerals here. This chapter also coincides with 1876 when Colorado became a state. And I call this chapter Ye Klept Yankee Doodle, a weird word, but it's from an 1873 newspaper article. And again, that 1873 date really coinciding with so much happening up there. But the article talks about a new fledged town ye clept or known as Yankee Doodle. This town had three cabins and four silver loads. And it was dangerous. Uh, this is perhaps the only written word that still exists on Rollins Pass from this era. Uh, and it's the word danger. It's at a closed mine entrance. And it was dangerous. Uh, the town of Yankee Doodle, in fact, had so many different reversals of fortune. I won't go into all of this here, but suffice it to say 
that as silver fell in and out of favor as a currency across the United States, the fortunes of the town of Yankee Doodle rose and fell on those decisions that were made. You can see on the right side of your screen a, a pretty dilapidated cabin. Those photographs taken in 1904 by famed photographer McClure, uh, probably indicating that cabin was created in the uh, built in the 1880s and, and it was uh, probably hastily constructed. The Forest Service did a sectional archaeological uh, work in that area about 15 or so years ago in order to improve post and cabling at Yankee Doodle Lake. And by doing so, they found more than 1,500 artifacts in just a short uh, period of time, some of those artifacts dating to the prehistory that Jason was talking about, but also of the mining occupation of the area, as well as railroad artifacts. And these are important because it helps piece together what happened here so long ago and, and the stories of the people who live there. And occasionally, you can come across old cabin foundations. This isn't graffiti. These are people who either built the cabin or who lived in the cabin. And Mother Nature is, is reclaiming this with, with that rotting wood. But it's just exceptional to see some of these names that will soon be lost to history. There's, of course, prospect pits. Uh, Jason was talking about you know those, those game drives. People wonder if they're prospect pits. These are prospect pits. This is what those look like. And this chapter has a pretty heartbreaking ending. Uh, in 1901, there was a 40 square mile wildfire, which was pretty considerable back in those days. You can see in this photograph from McClure in 1904, uh, the trees on Ginn Mountain, they just look like matchsticks. And it's probably because of this wildfire tearing through the area three years earlier. And there's an unfortunate uh, ending to the story about a man named McMurty who lived in a cabin on Ginn Mountain. He went back into his burning cabin in order to rescue some personal artifacts, and he later succumbed to his injuries. So one final overlapping layer uh, in this particular era is the early iron and steam. And uh, early attempts at running rails over Rollins Pass uh, largely were met in failure. Those who are familiar with the area know what I've probably just circled. That area is filled in with snow. Uh, but in the, the late summertime, it, it looks like a cave or a proto-tunnel. It actually was a tunneling attempt uh, by one of the narrow gauge railroads that was attempting to run rails over the pass. All of that uh, debris, the tailings were pushed into the northern part of the lake and really changed the area. In fact, if you look at some of these old photographs, one of these is from Dr. LaBelle's collection, you don't see that bump of tailings in the northern part of the lake. So the railroad did succeed in changing this area. And of course, the railroad changed the area at King Lake. You can see an attempted tunnel here at the shoreline. So it wasn't until 1904 that the Denver Northwestern and Pacific Railroad built their route over the Continental Divide. And it's all because of David Moffat. Uh, Moffat was a larger than life character. He loved bursting through all of the opposition and barriers that were placed in his way. And we'll talk about more, talk about that more in a moment. Uh, the Moffat Road, of course, is more than just the rails over Rollins Pass. The Moffat Road stretches from Denver to Craig, Colorado. And the photographs from this era are just absolutely exceptional. This is of a rotary parked atop one of the Devil Slide trestles. You can see two men uh, hanging out of the windows, posing for the photograph. And they built uh, incredibly large snow sheds to cover the rails to protect them from snow. Um, and when there weren't uh, snow sheds, avalanches took hold. You can see in the far distance uh, some rail cars that have been derailed. And this train appears trapped like an almond in a white chocolate bar, uh, at least until they can dig it out. Even when there's no snow, there's so many different challenges. This is, appears to be a summer scene. A boulder has pushed uh, an engine off of its tracks. This has gone from a, a decent day to a really bad day, uh, especially because there's a pretty steep drop off on the other side of this locomotive. But through all of this, the men, the workers, they had a sense of humor when facilities were closed uh, because of winter snows. And imagine the camaraderie these men had. And this goes back to imagine if you were born a little bit earlier, perhaps you would have been in this photograph and these would have been your compatriots. So what were the trains carrying? Everything from wool and agricultural products and precious minerals and metals, lumber, fish, chicken, eggs, fresh fruits, and daily at least 20,000 head of cattle. And of course, people. 
uh, including Doc Susie, who made her way across the Continental Divide and settled in Fraser as the first physician. But the newspaper articles of the time spoke so highly of the route. Ever been to the top of the world? The greatest one day scenic trip in the world? Words have no power to adequately picture the wonders of the trip beyond Toland. And it drew people, many people, and they enjoyed playing in these eternal snow fields, June, July, August, September, atop Rollins Pass and building snowballs uh, and, and throwing those at others. And they were no different than us. This billboard here, uh, near Jenny Lake talking about telegraph your friends from Corona. That's what we would do now. It's just uh, on a mobile device. And those telegraph poles stretch all the way to Denver to carry those messages. They were also off-road enthusiasts. They didn't have the technology we had, but they used donkeys. And of course, the towns and settlements of Rollins Pass experienced their own reversals of fortune. Almost all of these towns, with the exception of Toland and the East Portal uh, construction camps, they've all been lost to history. One of which I'd like to talk about is the town of Arrow. This is an exceptionally rare photograph. In fact, this is the first time I've ever shown this photograph in a presentation. Uh, just a great look at Arrow looking west towards Byers Peak. Near this area is a gravesite uh, of R.M. Smith. And uh, his obituary says that he was a man of unusual intelligence. And it further says that he was a Union Army captain in the Civil War. And this goes back to the beginning about Abraham Lincoln. R.M. Smith was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln. He might have known him just based on his rank in the Union Army. We won't know for sure or without more research, but just fascinating history that's lo located literally in our backyards. This is a better look at the town of Arrow uh, from famed photographer McClure. And Arrow had so many people. If you take the 2010 census of the towns of Winter Park and Fraser, add those together, it still doesn't equal the amount of people Arrow had in its heyday. Arrow had a, a main street lined with gas lamps. This was an amenity seen in only really large cities at the time, such as Chicago. And Arrow had 11 saloons, a post office, a pharmacy, four different sawmills, homes, and, and so much more, at least until 1915 when the owner of the Elk Saloon set fire to his establishment in hopes of collecting insurance money. And that decision basically burned almost all of the entire town to the ground. This is a look post fire, there's not much there. And ultimately when the railroad left the area, all of this was lost to time. And the railroad left the area because of the construction of the Moffat Tunnel from 1923 to 1928. The Moffat Tunnel was really uh, very much needed. Uh, you can see, that it would take in the best of conditions 150 minutes for a train to go up and over Rollins Pass, drop a zero uh, for sending a train through the Moffat Tunnel. It's just so much more efficient. Uh, trains had to do more than 10,800 degrees of curvature. That's 30 complete circles. Contrast that with the straight route. There's also no avalanches inside of the Moffat Tunnel. There's no blizzards, thunderstorms, any of these uh, issues. So the, the benefits of the tunnel became quite apparent uh, almost from day one. And it was a lot of hard work. Uh, this is from the Department of the Interior. It's uh, footage from 1925. These are men who are drilling the heading and placing sticks of dynamite in order to blast through uh, the Moffat tunnel to create, uh, to connect both sides and just exceptional footage. Unfortunately, it's just so short, but uh, really neat stuff. And it was a lot of hard work, not only inside the shoulder of James Peak, but also bringing this from blueprints literally to pouring the foundation and, and framing up the East Portal ventilation plant, continuing that hard work until finally in 1928, the Moffat Tunnel is open and ready uh, for trains. And when uh, this did happen, newspapers did not hold back. The top of the world has been abandoned. It goes without regrets. So what happened in the intervening years? The Moffat Tunnel is now open. Uh, but cars are not yet on Rollins Pass. This is the chapter that I call Disregarded and Overlooked, although another uh, title could be Discarded and Overflown. Pay attention to this concrete pad here. I'll, I'll revisit that in a moment, but let's talk about the discarded part. So it was 1935, the Denver and Salt Lake Railway petitioned the Interstate Commerce Commission to remove the rails over Rollins Pass. 
Two months later, the Interstate Commerce Commission replied and said that Rollins Pass has served the purpose for which it was constructed and that the proposed abandonment would not result in public inconvenience. So the rails were removed and the towns were dismantled. Uh, this is just a look uh, the following year at, at uh, kind of the, the destruction as, as everything was being dismantled, including, uh, according to Forest Service records, the Corona Clubhouse or the Corona Dining Hall, sometimes known as the Corona Hotel. So going back to that concrete pad, what was there? If we look to the Cordova Mesa, uh, we see the Beacon 48 power shed. Uh, so this was a similar power shed atop Rollins Pass. And early aeronautical charts in 1948 point to beacon number 82. It was a rotating light with course lights. Complicated machinery, but simplistic in its operation. This, I have to give special thanks to Steve Pott, who attended one of our presentations uh, many years ago. This is the only picture that I've ever seen of the beacon in operation. In fact, the FAA themselves do not have a picture of the beacon in operation. So really neat photograph. And that beacon still exists. This is in storage at the Pioneer Village Museum in Hot Sulphur Springs. It just needs a little bit of Windex and an electrician and it's uh, good to go. So as we move forward through time, we get to the era of uh, steel and gasoline, 1956. So some of those uh, ties that were removed from the railroad being abandoned were given uh, face plates and numbers, part of an auto tour and a pamphlet that were given uh, to drivers. And the Lieutenant Governor of Colorado at the time in 1956 snipped the ribbon at, at the top of Rollins Pass and freed the automobile to travel uh, this historic route. And despite Colorado's population being pretty small, those who lived nearby in the area really enjoyed uh, taking in the sights and, and seeing what the railroad had to contend with in, the, in that time period. At least until 1979, when there was a partial collapse at one of the portals of Needles Eye Tunnel. The tunnel was repaired in the 1980s, but a similar partial collapse in 1990 resulted in a baloney amputation and the road over the pass has been closed as a thoroughfare for the past three decades. These news articles all discuss a closed Rollins Pass. In a few years, the Rollins Pass Road will have to be abandoned without something done to it. Responding to appeals that have been almost frantic from Grand County, promises have been broken, uh, but history has a unique way of repeating itself. Uh, and a closed Rollins Pass has been a frustration. All of these articles are from 1900 to 1923, even predating the Moffat Road over Rollins Pass. So let's talk recent history, the last three decades. What has happened? Well, in 1997, there was a boundary increase to the 1980 National Register of Historic Places entry for Rollins Pass for the railroad over the Rollins, Rollins Pass route. Uh, the boundary increase was to include uh, John Rollins's toll wagon road. Uh, all of this is cross-listed on the State Register of Historic Properties, too. And in 2012, the Hill Route over Rollins Pass was listed by Colorado Preservation, Inc. as one of the most endangered sites in Colorado. About five years ago, my wife and I participated in a U.S. Forest Service Passport in Time project on Rollins Pass, looking at all of the prehistory and history in the area. And that experience quite literally paints a new picture of what happened up there so long ago. So we came across a bucket of green paint as well as a painted roof shingle. And green paint was very easy to produce uh, at the time in the, the uh, turn of the century uh, when the trains were going over Rollins Pass. And it was also resistant to fading. But that green paint unlocks this gray scale image we know for a fact that the dining hall has kind of a burnt orange or red bricks, but we now know that the roof was green. So this was a rather Christmassy looking building. Another mystery that this Passport and Time project solved were these railroad ties. It appears to be a fence between Sunnyside and Ptarmigan Point on the west side of Rollins Pass. What was here? Uh, U.S. Forest Service flyover imagery from 1946 show it's, it's more than a fence, it's actually a complete square. It was an outdoor laboratory for science. This was the Corona Range study plot, also known as the Corona Exclosure, where they were running experiments on tundra, both inside and outside of that exclosure. The Forest Service, uh, as part of that Passport and Time project that I was involved with, we found the smallest of artifacts piecing together these old stories, buttons, uh, dishware. So dishware that uh, had patterns on it or, or colors indicated a female presence at the camp. 
And some of the dishware was absolutely magnificent. There's also other dishware elsewhere, as well as uh, uh, flatware. Skillets, along with bison bones, you can piece together what they were eating quite literally, from the bison bones to calumet baking powder, these can dumps throughout the forest. It's, it's a trash with a purpose. It, it really informs us about their lives. And this was quite interesting. There's uh, Laughlin and Rand Powder Company kegs. Uh, they're empty of, of their black powder. But that company used visionaire ciphers uh, to encode their recipes so that if their headquarters was broken into, it would require a shifted Caesar alphabet in order to de uh, decrypt that recipe. So pretty clever things that were happening. And of course, you can almost stand quite literally in their shoes. And learning all of this really brings into focus the lives of the men and women who not only called Rollins Pass home, but who vacationed through the area and who lived and worked up there. And uh, I'm not the only one. Brad Schwartzwelter does incredible work. Uh, he brought the historic Moffat Cup along with historic preservation legend Dana Crawford back to Union Station in 2019. If you haven't seen the Moffat Cup, it's exceptional. It's across from the Amtrak counter and it's 230 pounds. It's solid silver with a marble base. Uh, and it was given to David Moffat uh, in 1904, and it's just an exceptional piece. So what does the future of Rollins Pass look like? What's 2021 and beyond? Well, we're rapidly losing our history. Uh, for the Moffat Tunnel construction, there were West and East Portal Company towns. Uh, the West Portal town, because of pressures of development, as well as land exchanges, no longer exists. The East Portal Company town is just five remaining cabins. Uh, perched on the edge of wilderness, and, and they're exceptional, but Mother Nature is taking a hold on those cabins. Uh, and last year, they were listed as one of Colorado's most endangered places. So Mother Nature on the outside, vandalism on the inside. It, it's heartbreaking to see uh, these, these cabins destroyed in such a way. So uh, hopefully we can uh, restore these. Also, the Grand County Historical Association has been quite vocal about another threat facing Rollins Pass, a proposed land exchange with the Forest Service and the development of roads and homes that would obliterate the setting of Lower Rollins Pass uh, that has remained intact for more than a century. You can see the historic railroad route overlaid here. And this singular accomplishment has the area listed on the State Register of Historic Properties, the National Register of Historic Places, and in 2012 was listed as one of Colorado's most endangered places. So to learn more and to help advocate, visit grandcountyhistory.org slash action or follow the GCHA on Facebook. Other concerns are the mistreatment of the pass, parking in wilderness, motorized vehicles on the Continental Divide Trail, and increased visitation too. As Colorado's population increases, so does Rollins Pass. It gets busier and busier. There's also artifact poaching. So if you see an artifact from any era, take photographs, take GPS coordinates, but leave it behind for the next person to enjoy. And as has been the case with Rollins Pass for decades, how can you love a place but not love it to death? And I believe the answer was in Dr. LaBelle's forward to our book about working together. Together, we can piece together new chapters regarding this most magnificent of places and assure that future generations can also visit and appreciate the things that have made Rollins Pass a great gate for many millennia. And with that, I thank you for your time and open it up for any questions that you might have.